Well, we're going to begin our journey through these kind of four chapters of Exodus. And right at the start, I want to give you permission not to follow along. If you would like to follow along, please do. It'll be on the screen and you can follow along in the Bible if you'd like to. But if you know yourself well and you know that listening to four chapters of Scripture is just going to be a little bit easier for you if you're not reading it at the same time, you have permission. You can even close your eyes if you promise not to fall asleep. But however, however listening works best for you. But we're going to read Exodus chapter 7. I'm going to begin at verse 8. So Exodus chapter 7, beginning at verse 8. And it's page 63 in the church Bibles. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned the wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the river. Confront him on the bank of the Nile and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now, you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this, you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. But the Egyptian magicians did the same things by their secret arts, and Pharaoh's hearts became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Instead, he turned and went into his palace and did not take even this to heart. All the Egyptians dug along the Nile to get drinking water because they could not drink the water of the river. Seven days passed after the Lord struck the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and into your bed, into the houses of your officials and on your people and into your ovens and kneading troughs. The frogs will come up on you and your people and all your officials." Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land. 
But the magicians did the same things by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the lands of Egypt. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs except for those that remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said. Moses replied, it will be as you say so that you may know there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials and your people. They will remain only in the Nile. After Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh. And the Lord did what Moses asked. The frogs died in the houses, in the courtyards and in the fields. They were piled into heaps and the land reeked of them. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. And throughout the land of Egypt, the dust will become gnats. They did this. And when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came on the people and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. Since the gnats were on people and animals everywhere, the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. In 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched into near-Earth orbit. It had been decades in the making, and the scientific community was really excited about the new and inspiring pictures that would come from a telescope that was free from the interference of Earth's atmosphere. And when the first pictures came back, they were amazing able to capture images from further away than any telescope on Earth. Here's the center of the spiral galaxy M100. That's 55 million light years away. And yet it didn't take astronomers long to realize what you may have already realized. There was something up with Hubble. Although the pictures were amazing, they weren't quite as amazing as they should have been. Very quickly, it became apparent that there was a fault in the main mirror within the telescope. A fault that was, was blurring and distorting the images that were sent back to Earth. NASA set about putting together a mission to go and fix Hubble. And in late 1993, that's exactly what they did. That photo was taken at the end of November, before the fix. Just one month later, after correcting the fault, Hubble took this photo of the same galaxy. Still 55 million light years away, but now much clearer, much more detailed, much more beautiful. Except here's the thing. Actually, that galaxy was just as magnificent, just as beautiful before that correction was made. All that's changed is our appreciation of that beauty, our understanding and perception of just how magnificent it really is. And friends, as we work our way through the book of Exodus in our evening series uh, this term, my prayer is that something similar might happen with our view of God, of Yahweh, the true and living God. 
You see, we've already heard him announce to Moses that, that by the events recorded in this book, the ancient Israelites and the ancient Egyptians around them will know that he is Yahweh. By this, you will know that I am Yahweh, your God. And as we come this evening to the account of the plagues in chapters 7 to 10, we might well ask, why 10 of them? Why string it out as long as he does? If Yahweh really is going to defeat Pharaoh, then, then why not just do it in one go? Just wave his hand and, and do away with the arrogant Egyptian king who opposes him and abuses his people. Well, I think we need to understand that, that these events serve to clarify, to bring into ever sharper focus the true identity of this, our God. As we read through these verses, as Moses and the ancient Israelites, Pharaoh and the ancient Egyptians, as they live through these verses, the glory and majesty, power and authority of the living God are made clear in ever-increasing depth and beauty. You know, the very first few verses of our passage this evening help to, to highlight the futility and folly of Pharaoh's position. As Moses and Aaron arrive in his presence, he asks for a sign, and they, well, they give him one. The staff turned to a snake. And as the court magicians conjured up their own snakes, so the real sign was delivered. Aaron's staff swallowed up their staff. I'm not sure there could have been a, a much clearer sign of what was to come. And yet Pharaoh refused to see. Verse 13 of chapter 7. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. And so what follows, in one sense, well, it reveals nothing new. We already know by this point in the Bible's revelation that Yahweh is, is creator and ruler, Lord and master of all that is. But what we see in, in this narrative ahead is, is clarifying. It's a bringing of, into focus of all that it means for God to be God. And of all that it means to stand in opposition to him. As Pharaoh does. This is what the Lord says, verse 17. By this you will know that I am the Lord. That I am Yahweh. And the first part of the picture to come into focus is his position as creator, as Lord of all the universe. There are so many links in, in these chapters to the opening paragraphs of Genesis. It all starts by the water, just as the creation account does. Only this time, as the Lord speaks, it's not to bring order and stability, but rather to bring chaos and disruption. First, the, the Nile, the very source of life in Egypt, is turned to blood. The fish die, and, and anywhere the blood pools begins to stink. I think we're supposed to see the, the parallels with Exodus chapter 2, where an earlier pharaoh had tried and failed to fill the river with death, as he called for the Hebrew baby boys to be drowned there. Now, at God's hand, it is indeed inundated with blood. The message should have been clear. Yahweh held power that Pharaoh could only dream of. And yet still, Pharaoh will not listen. Still, Pharaoh hardens his heart. And so next, the frogs come. 
pouring out of the Nile, a writhing mass of damp, clammy, wriggling flesh. That word team that we get in in verse 3 of chapter 8, the Nile will team with frogs. Well, that takes us again back to the creation account. There the waters teemed with life. But here, they don't stay in the water. Rather, the frogs came up and, and covered the land. That creator's great act of separating the waters, of, of gathering the land, even that appears to have been reversed. The boundary blurred as what should be in the river spills out onto the land. In his desperation, perhaps, Pharaoh pleads for relief. But it's evident his heart hasn't changed. Or if it has, it's only become harder. So that you may know There is no one like Yahweh our God, says Moses in verse 10. But friends, Pharaoh will not know. Still, he hardened his heart and would not listen. And so, this time without warning, the third plague comes. From the very dust of the ground where before the creator had formed humanity from the dust, now he brings forth gnats, swarming clouds of tiny bugs that cover everything and and smother life, people and animals, everywhere. And for the first time, Pharaoh's magicians can't replicate it. They can't imitate the Lord of all. For them, at least, there seems to be some clarity. For the court magicians, the picture is clearing. It's coming into focus. Just look at verse 19 of chapter 8. The magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. As the creator undoes his own work. As he decreates in ancient Egypt. So for some, his identity, his majesty, is becoming clear. But for Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not listen, just as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes to the river and say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. If you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials, on your people and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies. Even the ground will be covered with them. But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This sign will occur tomorrow. And the Lord did this. Dense swarms of flies poured into Pharaoh's palace and into the houses of his officials. Throughout Egypt, the land was ruined by flies. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Go, sacrifice to your God here in the land. But Moses said, That would not be right. The sacrifices we offer the Lord our God would be detestable to the Egyptians. And if we offer sacrifices that are detestable in their eyes, will they not stone us? We must take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God as he commands us. Pharaoh said, I will let you go to offer sacrifices to the Lord your God in the wilderness, But you must not go very far. Now pray for me. Moses answered, As soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord. And tomorrow the flies will leave Pharaoh and his officials and his people. 
only let Pharaoh be sure that he does not act deceitfully again by not letting the people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Then Moses left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and the Lord did what Moses asked. The flies left Pharaoh and his officials and his people. Not a fly remained, but this time also Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let the people go. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them back, the hands of the Lord will bring a terrible plague on your livestock in the field, on your horses, donkeys and camels, and on your cattle, sheep and goats. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and that of Egypt, so that no animal belonging to the Israelites will die. The Lord set a time and said, tomorrow the Lord will do this in the land. And the next day the Lord did it. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. Pharaoh investigated and found that not even one of the animals of the Israelites had died. Yet his heart was unyielding and he would not let the people go. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from a furnace and let Moses toss it into the air in the presence of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over the whole land of Egypt and festering boils will break out on people and animals throughout the land. So they took soot from a furnace and stood before Pharaoh. Moses tossed it into the air and festering boils broke out on people and animals. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils that were on them and on all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said to Moses. I don't know about you, but when I look at those awesome pictures of space, of nebulae and galaxies and star clusters, trillions of miles wide, I'm not only stunned by the reality of what's up there, I'm also humbled by the reality of what's down here, by the reality of who I am. Seeing space more clearly opens my eyes to a clearer picture of who I am as well. And as the true and living God makes himself known, so our picture of who we are begins to come into focus. In the fourth plague, the, the plague of flies, we see for the first time a difference between the experience of the ancient Egyptians and of the ancient Israelites. Verse 22 of, of chapter 8, the Lord says to Pharaoh, But on that day I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. As our picture of, of Yahweh becomes clearer, as his character and his ways are, are brought more sharply into focus, so we see the profound implications for us, his creatures. He is a, a God of justice who will bring his, his good and right judgment on those who oppose him. And he is a God of mercy and grace who will act to save those whom he loves. The ancient Israelites were deserving of God's wrath and judgment just as the ancient Egyptians were. And yet this merciful, gracious God had set his hand upon them. He had decided in his kindness to save them, 
to draw them towards him, to be his people, and that he might be their God. It is by the events of the Exodus that they might know this glorious truth. As the plagues unfold, not only do they bring definition to our picture of Yahweh, but they also clarify the position of the people before him. And that's just as true for for Pharaoh as it is for the ancient Israelites. He responds again with a a half-hearted promise to change, only to go back on his word. So then the fifth plague comes, this time a plague in the truest sense, a a devastating disease that rips through the livestock of the Egyptians. Horses, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep, goats, they're all affected. But not the Hebrew livestock. That remains untouched. And notice that that even as he is confronted with this separation, with this clarification, even as he stands before the healthy Hebrew herds, so Pharaoh's own position before Yahweh is made clear. Verse 6 of chapter 9. And the next day the Lord did it. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. Pharaoh investigated and found that not even one of the animals of the Israelites had died. Yet his heart was unyielding, and he would not let the people go. It's the repeated refrain of of these four chapters, isn't it? Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He would not listen. He would not let the people go. Now, I think we often come to these verses and and we ask, why? Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? But, you know, I think a better question to ask is how? How did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Because what we see is that it is as Yahweh is revealed that Pharaoh's heart becomes hard. As the picture of of just who this God is becomes more and more clear, more and more into focus, gains greater and greater definition, so Pharaoh's opposition to him becomes clearer too. As the character and and ways of Yahweh are made known amongst the nations, so the implacable, unyielding rejection of him is revealed in Pharaoh. It's almost as though, as the light shines brighter, so Pharaoh screws his eyes shut tighter. He will not see who Yahweh is. He refuses to see. Does Pharaoh harden his own heart? You bet. As the Lord reveals over and over again who he is, as each successive action demonstrates his power and authority in this universe, so Pharaoh becomes more and more entrenched in his position. He will not yield to anyone. And certainly not to this God. Does God harden Pharaoh's heart? Undoubtedly. As he makes clear who he is, the the God of justice and righteousness, love and compassion, so he brings into focus who Pharaoh is. The epitome of cruelty and brutality, evil and wickedness. We've already seen, haven't we, how how Pharaoh serves at one level as the, the representative of Satan, the king of this age, the one who totally and utterly opposes the true and living God. And just as darkness is defined by the lack of light, so evil becomes clearer when we have a sharper picture of good. 
as God's revelation unfolds in the pages of Scripture, we see not only him better, we see ourselves and we see Satan more clearly. The choice before us becomes clearer. The sides that we may choose better defined. That is the clarifying, dividing nature of the gospel of God. This God, this Yahweh makes a distinction, draws a dividing line between those who may find life in him and those destined only for death. As the sixth plague falls on Egypt, it's becoming clear to some, at least, that they can no longer oppose Yahweh. Verse 11 of chapter 9. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils that were on them and on all the Egyptians. For some in Pharaoh's court, the actions of the living God had brought helpful clarity. They could no longer stand. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he would not listen to Moses and Aaron. Just as the Lord had said to Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me. Or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. You still set yourself against my people and will not let them go. Therefore, at this time tomorrow, I will send the worst hailstorm that has ever fallen on Egypt from the day it was founded till now. Give an order now to bring your livestock and everything you have in the field to a place of shelter, because the hail will fall on every person and animal that has not been brought in and is still out in the field, and they will die. Those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord hurried to bring their slaves and their livestock inside. But those who ignored the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky so that hail will fall all over Egypt on people and animals and on everything growing in the fields of Egypt. When Moses stretched out his staff towards the sky, the Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flashed down to the ground. So the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Hail fell and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in all the lands of Egypt since it had become a nation. Throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both people and animals. It beat down everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree. The only place it did not hail was the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron This time I have sinned, he said to them. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Pray to the Lord, for we have had enough thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't have to stay any longer. Moses replied, when I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands in prayer to the Lord. The thunder will stop, and there will be no more hail, so you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord God. The flax and barley were destroyed, since the barley was in the ear and the flax was in bloom. The wheat and spelt, however, were not destroyed because they ripen later. Then Moses left Pharaoh and went out of the city. He spread out his hands towards the Lord. The thunder and hail stopped, and the rain no longer poured down on the land. 
When Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts. So Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not let the Israelites go, just as the Lord had said through Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials, so that I may perform these signs of mine among them, that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, and that you may know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will fill your houses and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians, something neither your parents nor your ancestors have ever seen from the day they settled in this land till now. Then Moses turned and left Pharaoh. Pharaoh's officials said to him, how long will this man be a snare to us? Let the people go so that they may worship the Lord their God. Do you not yet realize that Egypt is ruined? Then Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. Go, worship the Lord your God, he said, but tell me who will be going. Moses answered, we will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters with our flocks and herds, because we are to celebrate a festival to the Lord. Pharaoh said, the Lord be with you. If I let you go along with your women and children, clearly you're bent on evil. No, let only the men go and worship the Lord, since that's what you have been asking for. Then Moses and Aaron were driven out of Pharaoh's presence. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over Egypt so that locusts swarm over the land and devour everything growing in the fields, everything left by the hail. So Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all that day and all that night. By morning, the wind had brought the locusts. They invaded all Egypt and settled down in every area of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, nor will there ever be again. They covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left after the hail, everything growing in the fields and the fruit on the trees. Nothing green remained on tree or plant in all of the land of Egypt. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now forgive my sin once more and pray to the Lord your God to take this deadly plague away from me. Moses then left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord. And the Lord changed the wind to a very strong west wind, which caught up the locusts and carried them into the Red Sea. Not a locust was left anywhere in Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let the Israelites go. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt. Darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand towards the sky. And total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. Yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, Go, worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. But Moses said, You must allow us to have sacrifices and burnt offerings to present to the Lord our God. Our livestock too must go with us. Not a hoof is to be left behind. We have to use some of them in worshipping the Lord our God. And until we get there, we will not know what we are to use to worship the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. 
the day you see my face, you will die. Just as you say, Moses replied, I will never appear before you again. By the ninth plague, Yahweh's decreation is all but complete. The beasts of the field laid low by plague. The seed-bearing plant so good for food, decimated by hail and finished off by locusts. And then to cap it all, the creator God declares, let there be darkness. Creation has been undone. Egypt has been undone. And at every stage, the picture we have of our God has become a little sharper, a little more defined. And the choice before the ancient Israelites, the ancient Egyptians, indeed, the choice before all humanity has become a little clearer, a little more focused. Because you see, I think we often get caught up, don't we, in what's happening to Pharaoh here. And we try to map that onto our own experience or the experience of our unbelieving friends. What if the Lord's hardening their hearts, we wonder? Is there any hope? And yet I wonder if we better understand the situation by casting ourselves in the place of the people. The ordinary Hebrews, or perhaps more accurately, the ordinary Egyptians. You see, what's become clear through, throughout this narrative is that Yahweh has revealed who he is. He has made himself known. He always was what he is. Indeed, that's what his name means. But now, what that is and what it means for us has been made clearer, has been brought into focus. And what it means is that you and I, the Egyptians and the Israelites, we all have a choice. Will we side with Pharaoh, with the powers of this age, screwing our eyes shut, stopping our ears, refusing to see God for who he is, refusing to listen? Refusing to acknowledge his verdict. Refusing to accept the way out that he offers. Or will we take Yahweh at his word? Will we open up our eyes and see? See what he has made known. Understand what he has revealed. Will we side with the true and living God? Will we fling ourselves on his mercy and accept the means of salvation that he offers? Because I wonder if you noticed in the seventh plague, the hail, there's a beautiful detail there. One that offers hope to each and every one of us and to all our unbelieving friends and family. Verse 19, God makes a way. He declares to Pharaoh, verse 19 of chapter 9, Give an order now to bring your livestock and everything you have in the field to a place of shelter, because the hail will fall on every person and animal that has not been brought in and is still out in the field, and they will die. And then verse 20, what a wonderful verse this is. Just look at who does that. Those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord hurried to bring their slaves and their livestock inside. Those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord. Some of the officials, Pharaoh's top men, those at the very heart of the Egyptian machine, some of them grew to fear the Lord. Some of them took Yahweh at his word. 
And some of them knew his protection. Not all of them. There were those who ignored him, those during the next plague who were told hardened their hearts along with Pharaoh. But some of them feared the Lord. The revelation of Yahweh up to this point caused some Egyptian officials to see him for who he is and to trust him, to obey him. God's salvation plan has always included the nations. He has always desired all people everywhere to come to him. That was the purpose of of choosing ancient Israel, that they might be a beacon to the nations. That they might call the whole world to Yahweh, to the true and living God. You know, on Christmas Day 2021, an Ariane 5 rocket blasted off from French Guyana in South America. On board was the James Webb Space Telescope. Hubble had had provided some magnificent images. Here's part of the Eagle Nebula photographed by Hubble in 2014. But the James Webb Telescope, well, that reveals even more detail, even greater clarity. Here's the James Webb picture of that same corner of space taken just last year. Mind-blowing, isn't it? And you know, the revelation of Yahweh in the story of Exodus is truly magnificent. But there was an even clearer revelation still to come a more detailed and an awe-inspiring view into the character and heart of this, our God. Almost 1,500 years later, in another part of the Middle East, darkness descended again in the middle of the day. Not this time for three days, but for three hours. And not this time on the enemies of God, but rather on the Son of God himself, Jesus Christ, as he hung dying on a Roman cross. There, in that moment, we see the clearest, most magnificent, most beautiful picture of who our God is. A God committed to righteousness and justice. A God who will not let the guilty go unpunished. And a God of mercy. A God of compassion. A God who provides. Who provides a means by which people everywhere, Israelite and Egyptian, Jewish and Gentile, ancient and modern, by which people everywhere, might be saved. In that moment, more than at any other time in history, the choice we all face was brought into the sharpest focus. Will we side with Pharaoh, closing our ears, closing our eyes to the revelation of the living God, Choosing to let his good and righteous judgment fall on us. Or friends, will we humble ourselves? Will we open our eyes, unstop our ears, listen and see. And throw ourselves on the mercy of God. On the means of salvation that he has provided in his son, Jesus Christ. Because, you know, we do see thunder and lightning, hail and locusts, darkness and death, all in one place together again in the scriptures. 
in the book of Revelation. As the Lord unveils the end of time as we know it. There is a day still to come when the just and terrible judgment of the living God, Yahweh, will fall on all who persist in opposing him. On all who harden their hearts. But in that same day, all who have put their trust in the crucified Son, in the one who bore the wrath for us, all who are found in him will be raised with him to eternal life, to eternity, an eternity of knowing this God, this righteous and holy, loving and kind, gracious and compassionate God. Friends, he has acted in history that we might know that he is Yahweh. The question is, will you listen? Will you see? Will you live? Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God who has revealed yourself to us. We thank you that in the history of your people, you have brought clarity and focus, definition to who you are and who we are. We thank you most of all that in the cross of your son, Jesus Christ, you have shown yourself to be a God of righteousness and justice and of mercy and compassion. And so, merciful Father, we pray today that you might make us those who see, those whose hearts are soft, whose ears are open. And we pray in turn that you might make us those who make you known to others. And that in your kindness, you might continue to gather to yourself people from every nation, tribe and tongue. That you might continue to soften hearts and turn people towards the life that we may only know. In your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.